And tonight we have Matt Osmond talking about being your own contractor. And excited about this presentation. Um, are you connected to the Teams meeting so that you can? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so you can just take over my screen. And uh, the thing is, if you've been around a while, you realize that there have been a lot of these times. Um, if you remember when the housing bubble burst some years ago, um, what happened after that was a lot of people lost their jobs, took a look at software development and said, hey, I can make a lot of money doing this. Went into software development. Next thing you know, there's a flood of juniors who can be had for a third of what an experienced person made. And all of a sudden, it's the seniors who can't find a job. But even before that, you had the time when if you were a US-based software developer, you were in real trouble because everything was going offshore. But even before that, there were the technology wars. Was it going to be Flex? Was it going to be JavaScript? Go back a little bit longer. Was it going to be Internet Explorer, Firefox, which version? And you can even go back farther than that, all the way back to WorldCom going under or the dot-com burst. The fact of the matter is we live in a very risk-intensive field. That's just the way it is. I can't do anything about that. What I can do is talk a little bit about navigating that minefield. So a few warnings before we begin. Uh, I know a couple of meetings ago, we got to see Kevin's all singing, all dancing PowerPoint presentation with tons of AI generated art that weirdly focused on squid based kittens or was it kitten based squids? Yeah, I didn't do that. Um, Quite frankly, this is a PowerPoint presentation I threw together yesterday. And last time we got to see live code, we got to see live testing as he explored through various code samples. I'm not doing that either. Um, this is gonna be a far more abstract talk. There isn't gonna be a line of code involved in this because this is about how to construct your career around the way you want it to go. And I am also not going to tell you how to actually get that, because quite frankly, anybody who does is lying to you and probably trying to sell you something. What I am going to do is tell you how I have started thinking about my career, and maybe you can get something from it, or maybe I'm just up here talking to myself. So about 15 years ago, um, my career was at its lowest point. I had already made the decision to leave software development. I was done. Uh, the problem is uh, the golden handcuffs, which we all wear. Uh, I was far enough into my career that there was no switching careers and replacing my salary as again we've all seen i'm sure we'd all love to be doing something else as following our bliss but let's face it our bliss is not going to lead to the paychecks that we're making right now so i went to talk to a friend of mine um and i went to talk to this particular friend because tom has a way of answering the question i should have asked instead of answering the question i actually did ask. Uh, and, and I do that. And I use him for sounding boards like this because in my experience, every time you get what seems to be a binary choice, should I stay in software development or should I go? The answer is almost always door number three. And sure enough, when I talked to Tom and asked, should I stay or should I go? He said, you should rock the Casbah. Nobody? Really? Oh my God, I'm old. <laughs> so he asked, what do you do? And I'd known Tom long enough by this point to realize that when he asks you a simple, obvious question, he has asked you neither a simple nor an obvious question. But the only thing I had was the simple and obvious. I write software. And he said, no, that's just how you get to what you do. What do you do? And 
as I often do with this guy, I told him I had the faintest idea what he was talking about. So he said, I do two things. I close eight figure and above deals, or I, do or I help you double your double, which is doubling the rate at which you double your revenue. He said, now I can train your sales staff and I can do a great job at it, but I hate doing that. So if you engage me to do that, you're going to pay twice what you would anybody else, because if you want me to do something I'm not interested in, you're going to pay for the privilege. So what do you do? And that's really how I started to think about this. First, starting with what do I do? And then, of course, moving on to the whole how do I actually get to do what I do? And then going on to how do I refine that? Because as it turns out, what I wanted to do 15 years ago bears very little resemblance to what I want to do today, both of which bear very little resemblance to what I wanted to do, say, 10 years ago. So we're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to start off with the simple fact that your career is yours to manage. You are a contractor. You, you are a contractor for every place you work. Doesn't matter if you're an actual contractor or if you have a full-time job somewhere, you have one job and one job alone. You work for yourself and your only job is managing your career. Everything else is just contract work you do for somebody else. So the first thing we're going to look at is how you, this is yours and nobody else's. Then we're going to move on to the concept of self-interest, because when you manage your career, your career, you keep yourself and your own interests first. But one of the things we really need to be careful about is there's a difference between being self-interested and being selfish. We want to make sure we're the right, we're on the right path with that. We're going to talk about not necessarily ways of developing your skills, because I think we all kind of have an idea about that, but ways to pick the skills that you develop. Because let's face it, we can't learn everything. We can't even learn everything about the bits of uh, software development that we're interested in. It's too big. It's too hard. So we need to be very discerning in how we spend our learning time. We're going to talk a bit about managing your professional life. And finally, the bit that I'm pretty sure everybody really would just like me to skip straight to, managing your compensation. Yes. So here's the thing. Your employer has different needs than you do. This should be obvious, but the more I read through social media, the more I wonder just how obvious this simple fact is. Your employer needs different things than you do. First of all, your employer has got to get value from you. Otherwise, there's no point in you being there, and therefore, you're not going to be there much longer. However, you need to develop a career that's fulfilling to you, however you happen to define that. That's more up to you than anybody else. And of course, the thing is, while a good employer will help your career, they're not really required to. And more importantly, they're not responsible for it. You are. So the question is, are you just kind of going through whatever is in front of you and doing that and hoping it works out okay? Or are you being discerning and saying, this is who I want to be, this is what I want to do? That's the bit we are going to try and dig in a little bit deeper to today. But first and foremost, your career has got to come first. I mean, let's face it, if it doesn't, you're going to be miserable, right? And if you're going to be miserable, then you're probably going to do a bad job at work unless I'm the outlier who tends to phone it in when he's that unhappy, and I suspect I'm not. So while your employer, like I said, may help you develop your career, 
that's not the same as being responsible for doing it. Your employer needs the value that you that they need that aligns with their goals. But what about you? Are you providing the value that you want to be providing? And this goes back to what Tom was telling me about training sales staff. Look, there's a lot of things I know how to do. There's a lot of them that don't go on my resume because I don't want people calling me about them because I don't want to do them anymore. There are a lot of things that I do in a very specific way because that's the only way I want to do it anymore. I don't want to mess around with other stuff and I don't want to give the impression that I'm the sort of person who's going to do it because I don't happen to be in the situation where I can say, sure, I'll do this for you, but you got to pay me a half million a year. Nobody's going to do it. It's not a conversation worth having. So what is important to you is going to be the first thing you really need to start asking yourself when we start talking about this. But before we jump in, we've got to clear up this idea of self-interest versus selfishness. Because for the rest of this, I am going to tell you that you serve your self-interest first. But that's going to sound really, really awful if we don't actually talk about what I mean by that. So selfishness. This is what we typically think when somebody is talking about self-interest, which is technically speaking, selfishness is just self-care, but we add to that meaning, uh, socially speaking. It's got the implication of being willing to hurt somebody else in order to advance. The thing about that is while you can get short-term gains from that, it's likely to do you long-term damage. I would even go so far as to say it's almost guaranteed to. And what you're doing, any good you're getting yourself is not long-term and it's not going to last long. What I define as self-interest, that which you need to keep first and foremost in your career is taking care of yourself in a way that is stable and long lasting. You don't get big lows. You don't trade the future for today. You take the long view and the short view. Self-interest does not mean happiness. And anybody who has been unhappy after doing the right thing knows this to be true. The thing with all of this, and this last bullet point is the really interesting one to me, your self-interest must focus on your actions because you can't control what happens after that. You can't take care of yourself based on what other people do in response to your actions. Because at some point, probably more often than you're comfortable with, that's not going to work out for you. On the other hand, you control your actions. You have a responsibility to do so, so the Things that you do in your self-interest need to focus on how you act, which is the thing you need to keep first and foremost in managing your career. And incidentally, this is also pretty solid advice for life in general, but we don't have that kind of time this year. So we're just going to keep this focused on an IT career. So. Uh, by the way, in case anybody's actually familiar with PowerPoint, yes, I just downloaded a template and I'm using that. The uh, graphics here are not going to have anything to do with what I've written on the slide. I'm not that deep. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> so ultimately speaking, taking care of your self-interest is about who you are. It's not about what you get out of being who you are. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about managing your career. So the first thing is developing your skills. Going back to focus on your actions and not your results. If you try and learn stuff that you think is going to get you a pay raise or a promotion or a new job or something like that, 
you are doomed to not only failure, but a lot of unhappiness. Because again, no matter what you learn, you're not guaranteed any of these things. It might not happen. So if you are going to learn something, and let's face it, we're all going to learn new things, focus on learning how to deliver the value that you want to bring to other people. And then let what happens next happen next. Now, the nice thing about this is if you, for instance, decide that you are really interested in Azure and you're really passionate about that, you really want to learn it because you want to help companies, you know, break away from on-prem and managing databases and managing servers, then in all likelihood, you are going to end up in a career where you can do that in all likelihood. And it's possible that you won't. But if you learn the things that you're passionate about, you stand a better chance out there. And going back to, again, that weird thing that I was told, understand what you do. Then learn to do that thing. Sorry, we're not ready for that one yet. <clears throat> so... Here's what Tom told me to do. Take a moment and write down two to three things that you do, that you want to do in your career. Don't go any fewer than that. You'll box yourself in and probably miss some things. Don't go, mo don't go more than that because you start becoming very broad and very unfocused. Uh, and they shouldn't be technology driven or skills driven. I want to use Redis better, or I want to work in the cloud. These are not going to get you as far as you want. And rather than trying to explain the difference, here are mine. My two, two things that I do. Number one, I design systems that people want to use. It's a very carefully worded thing. Uh, number one, I design systems. I'm a pretty decent implementer. There are better. I can point to a couple of better in this room. I'm not bad at it, but my passion lies around the design of these systems. Secondly, that people want to use, not that people have to use. If you want somebody to maintain your big ball of mud, you should probably go talk to somebody else because I'm not going to be great at that. I'm going to keep pushing to try and turn your big ball of mud into something people want to use, which means we have a pretty bad fit. The second thing I do, and yes, this is just a tad uh, over dramatically put, but I bring order from the chaos. I take systems that are too complex, too big, not well known, and turn them into well ordered, easily understood systems. And I use the term systems deliberately because whether it's an application, a set of APIs, uh, your DevOps processes, your team develop, your team setup. If it's a organization of some sort, if it's a set of processes of some sort, I like making them better. I like cleaning them up. I like stripping away the cruft from it all. Now, these activities, of course, have foreseeable benefits to any employers or clients that I might have, but that's not the point. Um, the point is, I know what I want to do. So now I, at the very least, can direct my career in a way that gives me a chance at getting what I want. Although it is worth pointing out in a pinch, I'll go do just about anything if there's a paycheck in it. But we'll talk about that later. Pinches sometimes happen. Once you have written down your two to three things, and I advise you to actually write them down. There's a certain mental commitment to doing that as opposed to just noting them in your head. I would then start looking into what you need to do 
in order to start learning how to do that. Because going back to needing to be focused and discerning, you can't know what to learn if you don't know what you want to do. But once you know what you want to do, you know exactly what you need to know. So then we go through the process of actually learning them. And again, we're going to talk about how we do that from our standpoint of doing things in the best way for us. And over the course of my career, okay, I'm lying. I read this out of a book, but that's fine. There are three basic ways of learning things, and all three of them are necessary. See everything that you can. Uh, put yourself in a wide variety of situations. Um, for instance, we tend to learn by seeing and doing application development. That's just kind of the sort of person that, gra that gravitates to software development, but that also kind of boxes us in to the applications that we're developing. So if there's a new process going on, wherever you happen to be working, ask to shadow it. Hey, can I at least see what this is? Maybe it's something I'm interested in. Maybe it's something I'm not interested in, but I don't know that yet. Either way, you see something new, you can make an opinion about it, and you know more about who you are and what you want and where your career goes. Um, I also heavily, heavily recommend what a uh, former coworker of mine called a forever project. Uh, mine is an inventory management system. Yes, boring, but that's the point. I try new things with it. I learn new techniques on it. It is stupidly over-architected, but that's the point. I put architectural techniques in that I want to get more comfortable with. I mean, my God, I think I built a circuit breaker into one of those once, and that's just lunacy to try and do. There are tools for that. Use a tool. But the point is, it's a context that I can code in. I mean, let's face it, we all know the hardest part of learning a new coding technique is how do I actually construct something that I can use this in? Well, have something. Create a social networking site. Not that the world needs another one of those, but it's a tool that you can use to practice and to see more. We're just going to take a quick brush at this one because we're all familiar with it. Uh, study much. Whether it's Udemy, Pluralsight, books, Microsoft Learn, whatever. The thing about doing is that only teaches you what you do. Studying teaches you the theory behind things. It teaches you what there is to know about what you're trying to learn how to do. And then my favorite one. Here's the thing. When you try new things, you will make mistakes. Sometimes you will make horrible, horrible mistakes. Sometimes you will not notice which Azure tenant that you're in and accidentally delete a production resource group. As a example of something somebody might do, the point is when you try new things, you will make mistakes. This can be a failure of you as a human being or learning to do something in a different way. That's a matter of mindset. And as a, another former coworker of mine used to say, if nothing else, if you can't be a shining example of something, you can at, the base, at least be a horrible warning against it. Moving on from there, because I don't segue well, To reiterate again, not a bit, not a bit of this guarantees you anything. And I'm going to keep coming back to that because we are so inundated with the idea of do this so you can get that. Life doesn't work that way. But if we continue to try and approach life as if we can do something that gets us something, we're just going to have to keep going back through that whole failure cycle. So again, this isn't necessarily going to get you what you want, 
However, if nothing else, if all of this fails to get you the external things you want, at least you're in the driver's seat. At the very least, you're not you know, you're not stuck in a career and you don't know how to do anything about it. You, you're you not treading water because that's just the circumstances you're in. You're in the driver's seat and that at the very least beats not being in it. Professionalism. So a lot gets said about professionalism. And this is not necessarily a lecture on how to be a professional, because let's face it, in all likelihood, nobody listening to this right now needs to know about that. What we're going to do is reframe these ideas a little bit, not in terms of be a professional so you don't get fired, not in the terms of be a professional so you don't make the people, you know, alienate the people around you, but how does your professional con uh, how does your professional conduct guide your career in the principles that i've been talking about here keep going back to this doesn't give you results it benefits you because you become a person that can work better, integrate better into a workforce. But let's face it, we've all been absolute professionals and been fired from somewhere for one reason or another, sometimes even reasonable reasons. It happens. It doesn't really guarantee that anybody's going to like you either. I like to consider myself a professional. I got a long list of people who kind of dislike me. Get that look off your face. <laughs> But there are benefits to this. For instance, not alienating other people helps get you into a position where you can be exposed to their opinions, their thoughts. It puts you in a learning position. And maybe it's a case of Somebody knows something about what you're doing that you've never heard of before, and you go, huh, well, I like this. Let's give it a shot. Or maybe it's something you completely disagree with until you think about it for a little bit. And then you start thinking, well, you know, maybe I was wrong. Or maybe you start thinking, I don't like this. And after thinking about it for a little bit, I still don't like it. But you at least understand your own thought processes better you are using your professional behavior in treating other people the way you'd like to be treated, not for an external benefit, but for your own self-interest of other people make you smarter. That, that's actually been shown, by the way. Uh, there have been fMRI studies that show new experiences, uh, new ways of thinking, new learning, create neural pathways. Coming to this regularly makes you smarter. See, big plug for you guys. <laughs> and it also works the other way too. Who here has worked with that guy? The one who knows everything. The one who knows exactly what you're doing wrong and is definitely going to tell you what that is that you've been doing wrong. And how many of you, be honest, you don't have to raise your hand, has been that person? What kind? <laughs> when you're that guy, you have a very real problem because you've already convinced yourself that you've learned everything that you need to learn. And unfortunately, the first thing you need to be able to do to learn something is to admit that you don't know a thing. So when you are that sort of unprofessional person, yes, you're going to alienate the people around you. Yes, the people you report to aren't going to like you very much. And yes, if there does come a time when, they are when there are layoffs, 
you are highly likely to be very close to the top of the list, but we are talking about how we serve our best interests. And as it turns out, being a professional is good for you. It's good for your career. It's good for your learning. So what I'm really trying to get at here is there are multiple ways of looking at in where our career goes. And finally, the bit I'm sure everybody has... No, wait a minute. That's not the right slide. Hang on. There it is. The important bits. So, we need to take a look at this from a somewhat different point of view. You know what, let's back up for just a second here. Uh, what is compensation? Anybody? Anything else? Oh, there we go. Not even gonna bother going on because that is exactly right. Employment is a transaction. Exactly. No, that, that's actually very interesting there. All value is perceived during the transaction itself. We do not pay for things based on the value they give us. We pay for things based on the value we think they're going to give us. Um, so I'm talking about perceived value is interesting to me. So I drive a stupidly impractical car. It's got pretty close to 400 horsepower on a frame that's only slightly heavier than a ton and a half, which is, of course, awesome in Indianapolis snow and ice. It can go zero to 60 in probably a shade over three and a half seconds, which is exactly what you want on a city street. And it's got a top end probably in the neighborhood of 170 miles an hour, which is pretty much cruising speed for 465, right? Yeah. Well, when it's raining. Only when it's raining, yes. The point is, why did I buy a car like this when, let's face it, the vast majority of the time, I'm not using any of that fun stuff. I bought it because I wanted it because it's cool, because it's rare. You don't see a lot of them in the United States because I can do fun stuff with it when I get out to a place where it's somewhat safe to do so. But the point is my perception of value for this car is way off than what <laughs> Nikki's is, who when she got her new car looked at weird things like how easy it was to maintain, how safe it is, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. What can you hold in its trunk? Nonsense like that. But the point is perception of value. And we pay based on what we think we're going to get from something. Companies do the same thing. Oh, one other Sorry, wanted to uh, throw this in as well. It'll come back later. Uh, this car that I bought is one that the common wisdom is that you cannot uh, negotiate the price on this car. I have had people tell me I need to stop lying about this crap because they know no dealership is going to let you negotiate the price to which I have admittedly replied the discount that I paid on my car is talking so loudly I cannot hear the nonsense you're saying because I knew one very important thing. The car salesman valued this sale more than he valued his manager's stupid rules about the price. So as soon as I understood that, it became a relatively straightforward matter of constructing the problem. Can, can you lower that blind? That light just turned on and...
Thank you. Uh, a floodlight turned on. Yeah. So the perception of value is what every transaction is about. That car salesman was willing to bend the rules he was under because the perception of the value of this sale was greater than his perception of the value of the dealership's rules, which were getting in his way. Companies, despite what LinkedIn will tell you, do not pay for job titles. They will not pay for experience, exactly. They don't pay for job descriptions. They don't even pay for what you do. Your salary is set by what the employer thinks they're going to be able to get from you. So how does this practically affect you? Again, an em employment is a transaction. I've said this. But all transactions are two-sided. We've talked a little bit about what the employer's side looks like, but what does your side look like? You are paying your time and your expertise. What do you value more than that? What do you value less than that? What do you need to see on the other side of that transaction to make the perceived value such that you want it. And I'll tell you right now, if the answer is money, well, heck, at least you put the thought and effort into it, right? Uh, I can tell you that there are a lot of really, really miserable software developers out there who are uh, only looking at money and nothing else. But, you know, I'm not here to judge that. I'm just here to put things in a framework for you. If all you want is to chase that bigger paycheck, it, I got to tell you, go for it. But this is a brutal industry. It does not necessarily treat people well and is not necessarily run by the people who should be running it. But on the other hand, if you can be paid enough to put up with that stuff, great. You know who you are. Go be who you are. You know, I, I am not trying to tell you that all these other things must be part of your perceived value. What I'm saying is understand what this means and what you want to see. All right. However, all right, that's awesome. But how do I turn general concepts like that into money? Because let's face it, I've said more than a few times, into effect that money isn't everything, but let's face it, it ain't nothing either. And while I actually firmly believe that you shouldn't just chase money, that's just me. And either way, let's talk about some of the ideas behind salary negotiations. And the first thing to others understand is every time salary comes up, you are in a negotiation every single time. The problem is software developers tend to be at a bit of a disadvantage because we don't realize that when a recruiter says, what's the lowest salary I should be looking at for you, you are now in a salary negotiation. The recruiter may not even realize that either. That is something that is a parameter that they are used to looking for. But understand, the second that question comes up, you're negotiating salary, possibly future salary, possibly not. When a recruiter says, what salary are you targeting? You're in a salary negotiation. When a company says, we pay this to that for this job description, you are now negotiating salary. Even when you get an offer letter, you are still negotiating salary and you can still push back on that. Whether or not you should, we'll get to later, but understand that anytime salary comes up, you are negotiating. So you need to take control of that action. Something I've 
talked about more than a few times, you can, and I'll get into some times when I've done this, you can make the conscious decision to not, you know, on more than a few occasions, I've taken a look at an offer and said, yeah, that works. I'm not going to worry about it. And the negotiation is over. I have accepted all is well and good with the world, but make no mistake, we were still negotiating. The opening offer was simply sufficient. Sometimes it doesn't quite work that way. However, what we can't do is effectively negotiate a salary without understanding a few things. And the first one, eh, which probably should have been up there, is what the heck is a negotiation in the first place? It's probably not what you're thinking of. It might be, but it probably isn't. You need to already have in mind what you need and what you value. In other words, what's your self-interest and how do we understand what we're going to do? Whoops. That's my last slide. So. <laughs> so. When we approach a salary negotiation, the first thing we need to do is remember these things that we've been talking about here. We need to understand ourselves and what we need. We need to understand that this negotiation is all about perceived value, both in the money and in the people who are involved in it. We need to be concerned about uh, taking care of ourselves in a stable and long-term fashion, fashion. And once we have understood all of that, we need to own our own actions. Whether we, you know, regardless of what we decide to do, we have decided to do something and did that thing. So talking a little bit about understanding needs because managing your career and that's the point we're talking about here is not the same as managing money in fact at the position that i'm in now i took a give or take twenty thousand dollar pay cut because the work i'm doing is the work i really wanted to be doing when i took the last job and thought i would be and it turned out that i wouldn't be we're going to get into things like that, too. But the point is, taking care of your career and taking care of money are two very, very different things. And again, if you are only interested in the money in your career, then you have a pretty short path between the two. But if you're looking at other things, then what you need to do is understand salary's place. It's not nothing. It's not everything. It is definitely a thing, but it is something that is part of a greater thing that, as you very correctly pointed out, is the big picture of compensation. For instance, do you like the company that you're looking at? If you don't, well, first of all, is that even <laughs> something that's going to go forward? Uh, are you excited about the work or are you just kind of, yeah, I've done this before. That's fine. Uh, what about the people? Are they people you really like, really like interacting with? Or are they people that you can get along with over the course of the day? These are all things that are part of the perceived value. And at least for me, I can't even begin to talk about money until I have a better picture of my perception of the value that a company provides. While we're at it, what is, if you're dealing with a recruiter, what do you think your recruiter's perceived value of you is? And for that matter, what is your perceived value of the recruiter? I've had some pretty bad ones, we all have. I've had some really good ones. We all have. Learning to tell the difference is an important career management move because 
getting involved with a bad recruiter, well, let's just say I've never had that work out well for me. I suppose it could in theory. I'm not going to bet my next job on it. And finally, and this is just a little outside the flow of things, but it's something I threw in the last minute because I kind of thought around uh, along these lines. Uh, I tend to see again on LinkedIn, and I've even said this to people before, the idea of knowing your worth on the market. Well, let me answer that question for you. You don't have any. You only have worth and value in the context of a transaction. You can say your house is worth $10 million, and as long as nobody's actually looking to buy it, sure, why not? However, the second somebody is actually looking to buy your house, now your house has a very, very easily discernible value, what somebody is willing to pay for it. You don't have a value on the market. Nobody does. That doesn't even make any sense. Have an idea of what your value is in the context of your next career step, whether it's with your current company or another one. That's when you actually provide value. And on the subject of owning your own actions, and I brought this up, being in a salary negotiation does not mean always pushing back for more money. In fact, if you're just pushing back for more money to get more money, uh, that is not really taking care of your career very well. You are going to cut yourself off from opportunities. You are going to really hurt your ability to grow in the future. But on the other hand, um, and again, going back to the idea of perceived value, what do you think it means when a company grossly underpay, offers to underpay for a position? There we are. They don't value that skill set. They don't value that particular function. If they don't value it, well, quite frankly, I don't even want to get in that situation in the first place. Uh, I, I've got a few canary in the coal mine uh, concepts, and that's one of them. If a company doesn't appear to value what I do, the canary's dead. I don't want to know what specifically is going wrong. I'm leaving the coal mine. On the other hand, if the salary is low, but not so low that it looks like there's something really bad going on, this also isn't necessarily a problem. I've said this time and time again, you can pay me a lot less for work that I really want to do. If you're hitting my sweet spot of the two things that I do, you can pay me less for it. You could probably get me to do it for free if I didn't have a mortgage and a couple of car payments, but <laughs> the point is, if it's in that bit of what I love doing, we don't have to worry about money because we've already got me on the hook. I'm going to do stuff that I love doing. If I happen to like the people I'm interviewing with, well, then, I mean, we're, we're just coming up with fewer and fewer reasons for me to say no. However, let's get super practical here. What is a negotiation? Anyone want to take a crack at it? what they want and what they're willing to give up. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, compromising, splitting the difference, things like that, that is not the way to go. Uh, I love a uh, example I got. Uh, husband loves his uh, black uh, dress shoes, but his wife likes his uh, uh, brown ones, so they split the difference, and he walks out of the house every day with one black shoe and one brown shoe. A negotiation is a search for the right answer, whatever that right answer happens to be. And that's the real power of it. The right answer can be, I walk away from this. 
if you have the power to walk away from something, you have a lot of negotiating power. If you are out of work, and this happened to me this last time I was looking for a job. Um, I got a interview with a company. The work looked really interesting. It was in a uh, area that I thought would be really fascinating and really useful. And I did not like the people I interviewed with at all, not even a little bit. And quite frankly, they didn't like me very much. Uh, as a few of you know, I have some controversial opinions about software architecture. They did not like them. But that wasn't the first time. Uh, some years ago, I got into a interview, matter of fact, from Theris. Um, it was an interesting looking company. They were doing some fascinating things with social media uh, and Twitter at the time. And the guy I talked to was nuts. He was doing architecture by buzzword. Really, really interesting stuff he was trying to do, but it was very clear that he had gotten a hold of a couple of concepts at a conference, thought they were really keen, and just wanted to do that. Incidentally, uh, two months after I turned them down, they were out of business. So keep in mind, the power to say no is huge. The power to say no when the other person thinks you have to say yes, even bigger. So the negotiation is searching for the right answer, not necessarily the answer that's best for both groups, uh, definitely not some kind of compromise or splitting the difference, it's what's right. Now, <laughs> maybe. I mean, I mean, now we're really getting into uh, perception here, but quite frankly, yeah, I've walked away from some negotiations and that was the right answer. I've paid more than I wanted to for things and it turned out that was the right answer. I just didn't like it very much. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, in that I wasn't taken advantage of, I understood the reasons, there were things at play that I didn't know about uh, at the time. So successful in that the right answer was uncovered. I just didn't like what they were at the time. <laughs> but just like that car salesman, I almost forgot to slip in. Uh, so let's face it, recruiters are in sales. Recruiters value placements because that gets the money and recruiters really, really value money. So what I'm saying in that is if a recruiter values you, they're not going to cut you loose because of a little bit of pushback or a little bit of working the negotiation some. Now, there's a line. At some point, you are no longer worth working with. But now we go back to our self-interest bit. If you are pushing just to push, if you are pushing to get more, if you're pushing because you want more, you're being selfish. And at some point, that's going to turn around and bite you. If you are looking at what's going to take care of me long term, you are so unlikely to cross that line. And quite frankly, if you do, then that either means you really need to take a good hard look at what you think takes care of you or take a good hard look at the recruiter. A recruiter, when they are talking to you, knows what the job takes. They should be willing to share information. Yeah, and you're stealing all my good bits. <laughs> so the conversation you should be having going to the negotiation, that's done with the recruiter. Once you are being offered to a, a company, 
we already know. We, we've come to an agreement of here's what your number is, what we need to do. And the nice thing is if you're working with a village every year, they know not only what the country will pay, they know what other people are being presented at, what your competition is at. You know, I I have a, a diagram one that I worked with that I had this thing back and I said, listen, the other guy looks almost the same as you on paper. He really does. He's asking twenty thousand dollars less. So, what do you want to do? And this is the negotiation that we're having because we're talking money. I, if you want to walk away, I'm sorry, we'll walk away from this, and I'll keep working for you because my job is to keep working for you until you tell me to leave me alone. But if that twenty thousand dollars, if all we're doing is pushing to push, let's let's look at all the numbers and this is what makes sense. A good recruiter is sharing all of that. So it's common wisdom, whether it's wise or not, uh, in a negotiation involving money to not be the first person to name a number. Now, it's actually a valid tactic to be that person, but that's harder to pull off. And I'm not trying to train uh, people in salary negotiations. I'm giving stuff to think about. So I won't do it. However, you can't just refuse to answer questions. That's not going to take care of anybody's self-interest. So here are some phrases that I use. And keep in mind, this is not gamesmanship. That's not what I do. I honestly and sincerely cannot talk salary about, uh, about a company, about a job, about a position that I haven't really looked at. I don't know the value. So I don't know what to talk about. So I will often say, I'm sorry, but I don't know enough about the company or the work, so I don't really know what number to put on it. It seems like I would be able to better talk about salary once I've talked to the company. I will often, depending on what comes back, but I will often say, I understand that there are internal processes that you need to follow, and some of them are about salary. Uh, if it is necessary for you to talk about this now, do you know the salary range that the company is offering for this position? Well, whether you actually get that salary range or not, you have an inroad to working with that number. Um, if I have to get really direct, I'm sorry, but trying to name a salary for an opportunity I haven't sufficiently explored doesn't work well for me. Doesn't work well for me. I won't do that is not something that I'll say. That's not possible, not something, it doesn't work well for me. It's non-aggressive. It is not trying to box the other person in a corner. It's explaining your point of view. And then can we table this discussion? Um, there's a really, really tricky one. I can't pull it off uh, because you must make this sound like a, well, this must be a sincere request for help and not a challenge. And most of the questions that I ask sound like challenges. How can I understand what an opportunity is worth to me before I've gotten more information? Now, if you can pull this off and actually have it as a question, again, I can't. You, you get something very interesting because the obvious answer is, well, let's get you in front of an interview. But with this, you haven't asked for an interview. The recruiter is thinking, okay, we need to get an interview if we want to go forward with this. Yes. However, since you brought that up, what happens if you are at your actual job? So two situations that I've been in. Uh, number one, my uh, pay raises did not outpace uh, inflation. And after three years, I was in real dollars making less money than when I started. Uh, another situation that I was in, I was no longer doing the job I was hired for. I was doing something much, much bigger and much, much harder. But the pay hadn't changed because of various reasons. The point is, if you're going to ask for a pay raise at work, number one, don't do it because you're greedy. 
It's not going to work. It really isn't going to work. However, if you have good reasons for it, like, you know, again, my salary, you know, my salary increases have not outpaced uh, inflation and I'm actually making less money now. You know, this is a good time to do that. Now, the thing is, um, salary negotiation is difficult. It's tricky. There's a lot to it. Uh, we don't have enough time to go into all of that. And I'm not sure how uh, confident I am in my skills on it, although I've pulled it off on occasion. Uh, there's a great book to read. Never Split the Difference, Negotiate as if Your Life Depends on It, uh, written by a man named Chris Voss, who used to be the FBI's top negoti hostage negotiator. Uh, you've heard the idea that the, uh, that the United States doesn't negotiate with terrorists. We do, and we are very effective at it, and it's all because of this guy. He's got an entire chapter on salary negotiation, and I have found those tools to be very effective. I just need to practice them a lot more. Finally, last thing, and you know, kind of as a summary, you know, we've talked a lot about different ways of working with salary, with compensation, with what you want to learn, with how you approach things. The big thing to keep in mind is you need to always have the mindset of I'm taking care of myself long term in a steady fashion. You don't want huge highs and lows. Yeah, the highs are great. They really are. The problem is what comes after the high, the low. You want to keep your life at a good, even keel in order to manage your career. What you do in your off time, well, that's not really the point here. But if you want a career that grows the way you want it to, with you in the driver's seat, everything has to be pointed towards how am I taking care of my own self-interest? And it can never be, I just want to be selfish so I get more. If you try and do that with a salary, you're not going to get what you want. If you try and do that with trying to get a job, you are really not going to get what you want. Your relations with your coworkers, your relations with management, your relationship with learning, it's never going to work. You keep this one North Star in mind. And again, I'm not going to guarantee that it'll work, but the worst case scenario is you're in the driver's seat. And I want to end up especially because um, a couple of these deviations have come up. There are some oddities that I've noticed, and I'm kind of throwing them in at the last bit because they don't really fit well anywhere else. Um, I honestly don't know if this has happened to anybody else, so I'm not asking as a rhetorical question. I'm actually kind of curious. Has anyone received an offer letter with a different job title than what they interviewed for? Well, there are way too many nodding heads on this one. It came up during the interview. Okay, so let me rephrase my question. Has anyone gotten an offer letter that unexpectedly had a different job title, often a lower job title, than what they thought they were interviewing for? This has happened to me three times. Uh, I bit twice and regretted it badly both times. Um, I don't know how off, uh, how common this is. That's actually why I was asking because you know I, I have no idea if I've just had a run of bad luck or if this is something that happens. Let me tell you, you see something like that, run. Run for the hills, don't look back because somebody is playing games with this with this uh, transaction. Somebody is playing games with what they say they perceive your value at and what they actually do. Canary in the coal mine, don't wait around to figure out what sort of toxic gas has just bubbled up, just get out of the coal mine. Second thing, and, and this is something I've actually thought a whole lot about, and I don't have a lot of great answers for it, but it is something absolutely worth keeping in mind for yourself. 
when you see offers of bonuses, profit sharing, uh, does ever is there anyone who doesn't know what ESOP is? Ownership program. The nuts and the bolts is at the end of the year, you get a certain amount of company stock equal to a percentage of your salary. So one thing that is worth keeping in mind is what is the value of those things to you as compared to simply having a higher salary? This is something I don't have even a lot of answers for me on. Uh, sometimes I, I realize I get a little jaded sometimes and can point to all the times that uh, companies, for whatever reason, stop paying out bonuses. And if I'm being super honest with myself, I can point to a few occasions where they did. ESOP is generally been good to me, but the problem with ESOP is if the company ends up doing very, very poorly, then you have a lot of worthless paper. So th this is one of those things that's worth asking yourself, what's good for me? Uh, bonuses and profit sharing are awesome ideas on paper. I, I love profit sharing as a concept because if my actions are directly impacting how the company does and therefore that profit sharing that I get. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a little more motivated to work. On the other hand, I have seen situations where we, the company had a profit sharing and the company didn't actually have any profits to share. So that can happen. So this is one of those things that you want to really ask yourself and understand that your answer today does not need to be carved in stone, but what are the relationship of these things as opposed to just money? Uh, broadening that out a little bit, I was with a company once that offered a 401k, just no 401k match. So it was basically an IRA. How is that important to you versus just more salary? How is yeah? How important is your insurance plan, uh, both life uh, or you know health insurance? These are questions that are going to shift over the course of your career. At least they did for me. But it's another thing to always keep in mind in that value, that perceived value equation. Always. Um, so I, I once worked for a company that uh, uh, they, they offered a decent salary, but their rates were kind of high. And all of their, they did a job, they did bonuses, they did all kinds of stuff. And everything was based off of a percentage of your, uh, of, of your salary. However, their raises tended to be very small. Their bonuses were enormous, like good sized bonuses. Eventually, I figured out that as the years progress, it's going to wind up hurting you because it's based off of a percentage of your salary, which isn't going up. So, yeah, the bonuses look nice, but in the long run, it, it's great on the short run, but in the long run, you're going to wind up falling behind you. So, this goes back to every second you're talking about numbers. You're, you are going to be salary negotiated. You're your insurance premiums, your stock option programs, your 401k match, your bonuses, all of those things are part of that salary negotiation. Right. So it is not only okay, but absolutely you should be asking questions about that throughout the interview process and interviewing the company as well. Um, if you're working with a recruiter, they should be helping you to understand those benefits going into it. The companies that we have that have ESOP, I have an ESOP specialist on staff that has a whole presentation that I'm like, before you even interview with this company that I already know you want to work at, I want to talk to him because I want to make sure you understand this benefit better than I can explain it. So all of those pieces are so important. What Matt's saying is, 
the, the salary is not always the most important thing. It's what you're learning, what you do in your team. There's so many other things that come into play. But for you to get a real understanding of all of this picture, you have to ask questions. A company says they do bonuses. What percentage of bonus? How is that calculated? How many, how many times does it pay out in the last five years? You know, I, I have this week, we had a, a person who got a um, counter offer from her company for $5,000 more than the offer that our client was making. And she thought that was great. And I talked to her and she said, it's wonderful. For the next two years, they're going to cap my commissions. I'm not going to be able to, to take any additional training with this company because I'm going to say in my job title, but they're paying me $5,000 more to do the job and do the same. They also funded girls and trainings quite a lot of that. They are, but for $2.40 more an hour, she was taking a cap to her commissions yeah. for two years. <laughs> so you have to find out the whole picture of it and ask those questions. And, and your recruiter or the hiring manager or whoever is helping you to understand this job enough that you want it should be able to answer those questions and help you do this. The same company I mentioned, however, they, they did do one good thing. When they went public, they dropped $10,000 worth of uh, uh, stock on literally everybody. Pre IPO? Wow. <laughs> Yeah. 
and they said no one's ever had an issue to take their five years of PTO. And they but they broke it down for them and said, as long as you don't take more than five years of PTO, and I wrote all this down during the interview process, you're definitely gonna get your bonus as long as you were, you know, billable the rest of the I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But then there were also a front that said, look, you're gonna be an architect. So you might not be a hundred percent billable because you're gonna be this pre-sales, right? For an architecture side. So we're revisiting that because we know it could be a problem. But we've never not paid out a bonus, even for the people who are So they addressed it head out of the end of the interview. And I just wrote it all down. So if it doesn't play out, so I mean I know some of the people there, but if it doesn't play out, I go, hey, well that's not that. So PTO could yeah. not be enticed by unlimited PTO. It sounds so creative. Is it I, I have unlimited PTO and I love my job. I love the flexibility that I have. I love being able to work from home seven days a week. I also take one vacation a year that I tell my team I am not answering my phone. Any other days that I'm taking, I'm still responding to emails, I'm still answering, I'm still checking because, well. I'm only making money when I run you guys' jobs. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, so if I'm just on vacation, there's other recruiters talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also it's kind of on the sales position. Yeah, it's right? not. You know, it's, it's not kind of it's there. Yeah. Well, that's not. Me. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Thanks, I gotta any other questions, comments before I shut up and go home? How do you determine um, the people or who you want to work with? There's always that one guy. <laughs> I mean, wow, that, that is really subjective. It really comes down to, do I like interacting with them? If that's the case, then, well, there's your answer. Uh, if that's not the case, the question becomes, can I interact with them in a useful fashion? Because let's face it, good and bad, those are really, really hard to deal with concepts. Useful and not useful, oh, those are a lot easier. So if somebody is, if so if I can interact with somebody usefully, even if they're a bit of a chore, well, that's great. That's somebody worth keeping around at work. Uh, if I can't figure out, oh, if I can't, figure out a way to work with somebody. Not, I can't right away, but if I can't figure it out and I just don't like the person, well, now we have a bit of a problem. If that happens like right up front, that might be a decision maker. But as for how to do it, I mean, wow. Uh, there are entire psychology courses to, uh, dedicated to this question. Um, I get them by having somebody do business development for me because I suck at it. I mean, yes, that's a little bit facetious, but look, I know where my skill sets are. Uh, business development was not in one of the two things that I do. You know why it wasn't there? I am terrible at it and I don't care. I mean, sure, in a perfect world with infinite time and resources, I'd eventually get good at that, but it's not going to happen. So I get customers, I get clients by working with a good business development team with good solid principles, with a plan moving forward. And then I help them by making the contracts work. Let me explain it. That's not positive at all. That's really important in your You, you are an employee of yourself. The only, the only people that my paycheck goes to is my family. So whoever writes that paycheck, I, I'm not beholden to them. I'm beholden to my family. <laughs> so it's a, it's a different understanding um, of what that, that term contractor means. Always think of yourself as a contractor, and especially in this field, somebody else will pay you. If, if you're not 
happy at the company they're not getting the, the things that are important to you somebody else is going to do it that's what we find out here it's from the job of the attorney right well your one job is you work for yourself you manage your career sometimes you're really really fortunate and you can find a great place where you can stay for decades because they are always providing you the value that you're looking for sometimes you can't none of that trumps the fact that you are working for yourself to manage your career in the way that fulfills you whatever that happens to mean and if you want to look at contractor in terms of that, sometimes I find in air quotes that the online people can't see customers by working with a good recruiter so that I can get out to a good company and spend time working from them. They see me as an employee. I see them as my contract of the moment while I continue to manage my own career. Quite frankly, that's the way I really like to manage myself. I really like staying at a place where I continue to get new challenges. And I am not the person to talk about that. I have done outside contracting work twice. It was from people I knew, and it, quite frankly, it's not something I really enjoy doing. It screws up your taxes, something fierce. Okay. Those recruiters, so if, if I place five parts in a role, and he's being placed in a role for 40 hours a week, and I know that he is only playing a half of that, then my first concern is the same thing with my other engineer. Um, so even with like an additional kind of like very difficult for a recruiter to deal with. So for the most part we don't do it for that. I would want would want somebody who is a sponsor for unethical third party. Uh,
I think it's one V and two R's, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm old, I'm tired, I'm going home. Thank you guys for coming out. Our next meeting will be um, May 1st. And that's going to be after function, making sense of this. Weirdly, no. So I tell you, if you are interested in cloud computing, show up to that one because Azure functions are nuts. They are so useful. At the risk of stealing a little bit of thunder, imagine a web service where, first of all, you don't have to worry about an underlying server because that's just none of your concern anymore. 
but it can use as a trigger more than just an HTTP request. It can use a change to a database as a trigger. It can use a change to a service bus as a trigger. It, it can use, oh, I love using functions for that. It's, it's insane. Uh, it can use a cron job as a trigger. 